Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. When reason returned with the morning, when I had slept off the fumes of the night's debauch, I experienced a sentiment half of horror, half of remorse for the crime of which I had been guilty. But it was, at best, a feeble and equivocal feeling, and the soul remained untouched. I again plunged into excess and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed. In the meantime, the cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented, it is true, a frightful appearance, but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went about the house as usual, but, as might be expected, fled in extreme terror at my approach. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. Coming up in this episode… Would you stay at your grandparents' house if their entire neighborhood was haunted? When it comes to hardened criminals in tough prisons, there is no escape, not even sometimes in death. At least 45 deaths of young men are attributed to the smiley face killer, but most police departments say he doesn't exist and by special request, I will narrate the classic Edgar Allan Poe story, The Black Cat. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. I spent a good amount of my childhood living with my grandparents in a very rural part of West Virginia. Their house, well, the whole area where they lived, was haunted. There were many times that we'd hear footsteps in a room nobody was in at the time, paper towel rolls unrolling themselves, things that you normally associate with some place that's haunted. But honestly, especially when you're very young, you really don't think about it too much, it's just the way things are. But one night, at least for me, that all changed. I was probably about six or seven at the time of this incident. My grandma had some relatives visiting and I really never liked them. They were loud, obnoxious, and generally unpleasant to be around. I was a quiet kid and had decided that I needed to get away from all the ruckus going on in the living room where my grandparents, my brothers, and these boorish relatives were talking. So I left the living room and walked into the kitchen. Let me explain the layout of the house briefly. My grandparents bought a two-room house from my grandma's brother and added on as needed, so the layout wasn't what you would call a traditional one. When you walked out of the living room, you entered a kitchen, which had a bedroom attached to it, and a door leading out to a small utility room used for storage. This room emptied out to the yard, where a small creek babbled away. There were other rooms, but for time's sake I won't describe them. Anyway, I was going through the kitchen to the aforementioned bedroom, that's where my toys were. When I walked in, the first thing to draw my attention was the huge crystal cake plate sitting in the middle of my grandparents' big kitchen table. My grandma was quite the cook and had made this cake from scratch. 
and it was beautiful. Because of the fact that I was so young, the cake plate was so massive and the table was so big, there was no way for me to move it. As I entered the room, suddenly the cake plate, without anyone touching it, picked itself up and hurled itself across the room. I stood there with a mixture of fear and awe when my grandma came running in along with pretty much everybody else in the living room. She screamed, why? Why did you do that? I worked so hard to make that cake. Why would you throw it like that? My grandpa walked in, looked at her, and said, you know that boy didn't do that, and you know what did. I'll never forget the look of fear and sadness on her face, or how her face completely drained of color. I know it doesn't sound like much, but that was the day I woke up to the fact that there are things in that house that weren't of this world. I started noticing, really noticing, what was going on. Is there a serial killer stalking college-aged men? The FBI insists no one is drowning inebriated college males and leaving behind a painted smiley face where he dumps the bodies. But no matter how many times officials try to quelch the theory, the rumor of the smiley face killer will not die, and the bodies keep cropping up. The theory originated with two New York City police detectives. Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte. They concluded that the deaths of at least 45 young men by drowning have too many similarities to be unrelated. Although the theory began in connection with bodies found in New York City, it spread to include murder cases from the Midwest. In at least a dozen cases, a painted smiley face was found near a body of water where a victim's corpse was dumped. Nearly all the victims of the supposed smiley face killer were white college men. The detectives speculate the motive may be jealousy, as all the men were good-looking, athletic, and academically successful. Because some of the deaths occurred the same night but in different states, the NYC detectives altered their theory slightly, believing that the murders were carried out by an organized gang of killers. They believed their theory enough to reportedly use their own personal money to continue the investigation when official funds dried up. The smiley face killer theory all began with the 1997 death of 21-year-old Patrick McNeil. McNeil was last seen drinking with friends in a Manhattan bar. Volunteers plastered the city with thousands of missing flyers. McNeil's body was found two months later and 12 miles away near the entrance to New York Harbor. Police found no evidence of foul play, but Detectives Gannon and Duarte were not convinced. They pledged to keep working on the case. Nearly all of the subsequent deaths have also been ruled accidental drownings involving alcohol. The FBI and several police organizations have researched the deaths and concluded there is no link. The Center for Homicide Research went so far as to publish an exhaustive report called Drowning the Smiley Face Theory. It lists 18 reasons that the theory doesn't hold water, including the fact that smiley faces are a very common form of graffiti and that murder by drowning is extremely rare. But a few criminologists agree with the detectives that there are too many similarities in the deaths to put it down to pure coincidence, and there have been frequent requests to the FBI to pick up the investigation, including one in 2008 from a Wisconsin congressman. The smiley face killer was invoked as recently as 2016 after the drowning death of a 24-year-old in Hoboken. Matthew Genovese had last been seen drinking at a local pub with friends. Like so many of the other supposed murders, Genovese's body showed no signs of foul play. Despite this, many Hoboken residents began to panic about a phantom serial killer possibly living among them. Despite this most recent case, even Gannon and Duarte have given up on their theory. 
after spending years and seemingly a significant chunk of their money on the smiley face killer theory, the pair stopped researching the case in 2012. The victims' families and a number of internet sleuths, however, still hold out hope that the smiley face killer theory will prove to be true. It would lend some sense of meaning to the deaths of the many victims whose unexplained drownings still haunt their loved ones. When it comes to hardened criminals in tough prisons, there is no escape, not sometimes even in death. America's most haunted prisons when Weird Darkness returns. It is the dark and lonely road. You drive, you're tired and falling asleep behind the wheel. The windows are down, the cool air blowing through your hair as you crank up the stereo. ACDC blares on the radio and you're screaming out the chorus. Then a set of headlights emerges from the darkness and your night has become a nightmare. Welcome to Last Exit, an anthology of 17 horrific tales where life on the road can sometimes take a dark and unexpected turn. Last Exit by Jason R. Davis, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. When compiling a list of America's most haunted places, prisons and jails are usually high on the list. The amount of trauma, pain, and terror experienced by the men who are incarcerated often leaves a lasting impression behind, and horrible events that occur behind the prison's high walls tend to cause the spirits of the men imprisoned to remain in death, just as they were in life. There is no escape, even after death. Number 1. The Eastern State Penitentiary, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Founded by the Quakers in 1829 who envisioned the Stone Castle as a place where criminals could become penitent for their crimes, hence the name penitentiary, the prison was a place of total isolation. Inmates were confined in windowless rooms and allowed no contact with any living person. Many of them were driven insane by the solitude. Punishments for breaking the rules were extreme, and suicides became common. Solitary confinement was ended in the 1870s and a century later, the prison was closed down. Since that time, ghost stories and paranormal encounters have become commonplace. Apparitions have been seen, mysterious footsteps heard, and strange sounds reported. Number 2. Alcatraz San Francisco, California. The Rock, the name given to Alcatraz Penitentiary, was the ultimate American prison. It was the place where scores of the country's worst criminal offenders, bloodletters, bad men, and escaped artists called the end of the line. Although it started as a military prison, for 29 years the prison kept the country's most notorious lawbreakers, including Al Capone, Doc Barker, George Machine Gun Kelly, and others, 
confined behind stone walls. The initial prison was built in 1859, but it fell into disuse by the 1920s. It was then reopened in 1933 to be an escape-proof federal prison. It was a brutal place of punishment and confinement with few privileges. Suicide, murder, and even insanity became common. In 1946, several inmates attempted a violent and bloody escape from the rock, but failed. There were a handful of other attempts, but only one successful escape in 1962 when three bank robbers using handmade rubber rafts and dummies with real human hair vanished into the dark waters of the bay. Alcatraz was closed down one year later in 1963. Regarded as one of America's most haunted places, ghosts have been widely reported ever since, even by staff members of the National Park Service, which now operate the property. Ghosts have been sighted along with strange sounds, screams, yells, weeping, and eerie music. Number 3. Ohio State Reformatory, Mansfield, Ohio The Ohio State Reformatory, made famous in the film The Shawshank Redemption, was opened in 1896 as a prison for criminals too old for juvenile facilities and not hardened enough for the Ohio State Penitentiary in Columbus. It saw untold thousands of prisoners during its years of operations, and while once applauded as a place that could humanely reform first-time offenders, the conditions deteriorated to the point that it became known for abuse, torture, and murder. Already considered overcrowded and inhumane by the 1930s, the massive prison was kept open until 1986, even after a federal lawsuit was filed by the inmates it cited that it was unfit for human occupation. Since the closing of the reformatory, stories have circulated that it is haunted by the tormented spirits of former inmates, guards, and prison officials who have simply never left. Apparitions have been reported, footsteps have been heard, and unsettling encounters have taken place in the cells where the inmates once lived, suffered, and sometimes died. One of the resident ghosts is reported to be Helen Gladke, the wife of Warden Arthur L. Gladke. She died in 1950 in an apartment in the administration wing of the prison when a loaded handgun fell from a closet shelf and went off. Her spirit has remained in the apartment ever since, often manifesting as the smell of perfume. Number 4. Ohio Penitentiary, Columbus, Ohio the Ohio Penitentiary opened in 1834, and while first condemned by reformers in the early 1900s, it was not closed down until 1979. The prison has since been demolished, but haunting memories of it remain. During its last years of operation, the prison saw scores of deaths from fire, cholera outbreaks, murder, and executions in the state's electric chair, but nothing matched the horror of the fire that engulfed the prison in April 1930. The blaze swept through the west block of the penitentiary and killed 322 inmates in a single night. While the prison was still open, inmates complained of ghostly sightings and eerie happenings. But when the buildings were finally torn down, tales quickly spread of apparitions among the ruins. Eventually, the prison was replaced by a sports arena which is also rumored to be haunted. Number 5. Maxwell Street Police Station, Chicago, Illinois The police station in Chicago's Maxwell Street neighborhood, known as Bloody Maxwell because of the escalating crime rate in the area, was constructed in 1889. At that time, the surrounding part of the city was home to thousands of Italian immigrants, including the Jenna brothers, who partnered with Al Capone's organization during Prohibition to make bootleg liquor within blocks of the police station. It became a notorious police station, known for corruption, bribery, brutality, and torture. Many lawbreakers never left the basement dungeon alive. The station was closed down in 1997 and began to be used by the security officers for the nearby University of Illinois Chicago campus. It's currently being used for filming for the television show Chicago PD. 
Although the cops and criminals of the station's past are long gone, stories say that they still linger here, especially those who were brutalized and killed in the dungeon. Screams have been reported coming from the basement, along with moaning, crying, and the sounds of rattling bars and handcuff chains. Number 6. Lake County Jail, Crown Point, Indiana The Lake County Jail, located in the county seat of Crown Point, was built in 1908 and enlarged 20 years later. At that time, county sheriffs were required to live at the jail, and so the combined residence and jail included all the facilities needed for its purpose as a law enforcement institution. Located within the walls were the family's living area, warden's residence, department offices, 150 cells, maximum security accommodations, institutional kitchen, food storage, heating and cooling systems, barbershop, and a garage. It was considered to be one of the finest in Indiana and thought to be escape-proof. However, on March 3, 1934, gangster John Dillinger proved it to be otherwise when he made a daring escape that gave the jail its continuing infamy. The jail remained in operation until the 1970s when it became a historic site. As restoration has continued over the last two decades, stories have emerged about a haunting at the jail. Apparitions have been seen in cells and corridors, strange photographs have been taken, doors open and close by themselves, lights turn on and off, and disembodied footsteps and voices have often been reported by volunteers and visitors alike. Number 7. Pottawatomie County Jail, Council Bluffs, Iowa Built in 1885, the old Pottawatomie County Jail is one of the most unusual houses of incarceration in America. The jail has a three-tier cell block with ten cells on each tier. It was originally designed to rotate continuously throughout the night by means of a water wheel in the basement, earning it the nickname of the Squirrel Cage Jail. In this way, all of the prisoners could be watched from a central location. Unfortunately, the 45-ton cell block was simply too heavy to work right, and it became stuck frequently. Eventually, the jailers gave up on the plan and a night guard had to be hired. The cylinder continued to be used until 1960 when a prisoner died in his cell and the cell block jammed, trapping the body in the cell for several days. After that, cell doors were cut into every cell. The jail was closed down in 1969 and during its history, four deaths occurred within its walls. One man died of a heart attack another in a fall when he tried to write his name on the ceiling, another hanged himself in his cell, and the last after an accident when an officer accidentally shot himself in the confusion of protecting the jail from an angry mob during the farmer's holiday strike of 1932. It's no surprise that these unlucky individuals, along with others, are believed to still linger at the old jail. Number 8. West Virginia Penitentiary, Moundsville, West Virginia The prison was built on the edge of Moundsville in 1866. The prison remained open for 129 years, finally closing down in 1995. During that time, the structure housed thousands of prisoners. Many lost their lives here through both state-sanctioned executions and during prison violence. Since its closure, the prison has become known as one of the most haunted sites in the country. Staff members and visitors alike have reported ghosts in the North Hall, where the most dangerous inmates were housed in the execution chamber, where Old Sparky sent many to an early grave, and the Hole, a brutal solitary confinement area that often drove inmates to insanity and suicide. With death, Violence, murder, and horrible conditions combining to make a terrifying haunting, ghost hunters have flocked to the former penitentiary over the years. Visitors claim to have experienced the sound of phantom footsteps, voices and noises that have no explanation, inexplicable cold chills, overwhelming feelings of panic, and more. Number 9. Wyoming Territorial Prison, Laramie, Wyoming the westward expansion of the railroad 
brought more than money and high times to the people of Laramie, Wyoming. It also brought a score of unsavory men and women and a crime rate that rivaled much larger eastern cities. As a result, the Wyoming Territorial Prison was built as a federal penitentiary in Laramie in 1872. The facility was plagued with problems from the start, with a fire in 1873 and a number of escapes. Of the 44 prisoners accepted in the first two years of operation, 11 escaped. By 1877, the prison was overcrowded and as its reputation worsened, changes were made and a second cell block was constructed. It became a state prison from 1890 to 1901. There were at least five cells for female inmates and several solitary confinement cells. Soon-to-be-famous outlaw Butch Cassidy was incarcerated here from 1894 to 1896. After its closure in 1903, the prison was given to the University of Wyoming, which used it for livestock breeding experiments until 1989. It opened to the public as a historic site two years later, and stories of ghosts began to circulate. With more than 1,000 inmates housed there over the years, it's to be expected that some of the prisoners or guards might linger behind. However, there is one prisoner who reputedly is more active than the others. His name is Julius Greenwald, and he was sent to prison for the 1897 murder of his wife. Prison lore states that Greenwald was adept at making cigars and convincing prison staff to allow him to make and sell cigars while incarcerated. He allegedly made the cigars from his cell on the third floor, a cell that was removed during a renovation of the site. Allegedly, Greenwald's spirit did not appreciate this and has manifested as a phantom cigar smell at the prison ever since. Number 10. Missouri State Penitentiary, Jefferson City, Missouri The Missouri State Penitentiary, known as The Walls, was constructed in the early 1830s to serve the newly admitted state of Missouri. The earliest prisoners made the bricks that the first walls were built from. The initial prison population consisted of one guard, one warden, 15 prisoners, and a foreman for the brick-making operation with an assistant. Eleven of the 15 prisoners were from St. Louis, and all were incarcerated for larceny except for one who was imprisoned for stabbing a man during a drunken brawl. Needless to say, the prison grew many times over the years until it closed down in 2004. During its operation, it saw many infamous prisoners, including Charles Pretty Boy Floyd, James Earl Ray, and Bobby Greenlee's kidnappers Carl Austin Hall and Bonnie Heady. They were executed at the prison. In 1954, there was a major riot at the penitentiary. The Missouri State Highway Patrol, Missouri National Guard, and police departments from Jefferson City, St. Louis, and Kansas City, Missouri were called in to help quell the disturbance. When it was all over, four inmates had been killed, 29 had been injured, and there had been one attempted suicide. Four guards had been seriously injured and several buildings had been burned. During its operation, 40 inmates were executed in the gas chamber, and Time magazine once called it the bloodiest 47 acres in America for the frequent violence inside its walls. It probably comes as no surprise then that since its closure, the penitentiary has become a hotspot for paranormal activity. Staff members and visitors have reported dozens of eerie encounters with lingering spirits, which have been seen, heard, and encountered firsthand. Up next, by special request from one of you, my weirdo family members, I'll narrate the classic short horror tale The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe when Weird Darkness returns. <laughs> While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, 
hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. There are very few among those with a love for the supernatural who don't also have a passion for Edgar Allan Poe. Poe wasn't simply a melancholy author who wrote about premature burials, sinister black cats, and talking ravens. He was much more. If you've ever read a modern mystery or horror novel, you can thank Poe. Poe invented the modern mystery story, mostly invented science fiction, and was the first writer to take the horror stories of the Gothic era and set them in modern times, starting a trend that continues today. With a lifelong interest in Poe, Troy Taylor decided to take his own look at the mysterious and macabre writer, his tragic life, unexplained death, and lingering hauntings. He invites listeners along to delve into the strange and bizarre world of Edgar Allan Poe, from his early life to his tragic marriage, his insane grief, his dramatically failed career, his links to an unsolved murder and the mystery of what happened to the writer in the five days before his unexplained death. Even more than a century and a half later, no one knows what happened to Poe before he was found delirious on the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, or what killed him. Why did he disappear and then show up in an incoherent state, wearing another man's clothes? Where did he go when he vanished and who was the mysterious Reynolds that Poe whispered about in his dying breath? And perhaps strangest of all, does he haunt the mysterious graveyard where his body is buried? Nevermore, The Haunted Life and Mysterious Death of Edgar Allan Poe, written by Troy Taylor, narrated by Darren Marlar. Find a link to the book on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. For the most wild yet most homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed would I be to expect it, in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence. Yet mad am I not, and very surely do I not dream. But tomorrow I die, and today I would unburthen my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world plainly succinctly and without comment, a series of mere household events. In their consequences, these events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me. Yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me, they have presented little but horror. To many, they will seem less terrible than Baroque's. Hereafter, perhaps, some intellect may be found which will reduce my phantasm to the commonplace, some intellect more calm, more logical, and far less excitable than my own, which will perceive, in the circumstances I detail with awe, nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects. From my infancy, I was noted for the docility and humanity of my disposition. My tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions, I was especially fond of animals and was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. With these I spent most of my time and never was so happy as when feeding and caressing them. This peculiarity of character grew with my growth, and in my manhood I derived from it one of my principal sources of pleasure. To those who have cherished an affection for a faithful and sagacious dog, I need hardly be at the trouble of explaining the nature or the intensity of the gratification thus derivable. There is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute which goes directly to the heart of him who has had frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere man. I married early and was happy to find in my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity of procuring those of the most agreeable kind. 
We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. This latter was a remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black and sagacious to an astonishing degree. In speaking of his intelligence, my wife, who at heart was not a little tinctured with superstition, made frequent allusion to the ancient popular notion which regarded all black cats as witches in disguise. Not that she was ever serious upon this point, and I mentioned the matter at all for no better reason than that it happens, just now to be remembered. Pluto, this was the cat's name, was my favorite pet and playmate. I alone fed him, and he attended me wherever I went about the house. It was even with difficulty that I could prevent him from following me through the streets. Our friendship lasted in this manner for several years, during which my general temperament and character, through the instrumentality of the fiend intemperance, had, I blush to confess it, experienced a radical alteration for the worse. I grew day by day more moody, more irritable, more regardless of the feelings of others. I suffered myself to use intemperate language to my wife. At length, I even offered her personal violence. My pets, of course, were made to feel the change in my disposition. I not only neglected but ill-used them. For Pluto, however, I still retained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him as I made no scruple of maltreating the rabbits, the monkey, or even the dog when by accident or through affection they came in my way. But my disease grew upon me, for what disease is like alcohol? And at length even Pluto, who was now becoming old and consequently somewhat peevish, even Pluto began to experience the effects of my ill temper. One night, returning home much intoxicated from one of my haunts about town, I fancied that the cat avoided my presence. I seized him when, in his fright at my violence, he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth. The fury of a demon instantly possessed me. I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed at once to take its flight from my body, and a more than fiendish malevolence, gin nurtured, thrilled every fiber of my frame. I took from my waistcoat pocket a penknife, opened it, grasped the poor beast by the throat and deliberately cut one of its eyes from the socket. I blush, I burn, I shudder while I pen the damnable atrocity. When reason returned with the morning, when I had slept off the fumes of the night's debauch, I experienced a sentiment half of horror, half of remorse for the crime of which I had been guilty. But it was at best a feeble and equivocal feeling and the soul remained untouched. I again plunged into excess and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed. In the meantime, the cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented, it is true, a frightful appearance, but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went about the house as usual, but, as might be expected, fled in extreme terror at my approach. I had so much of my old heart left as to be at first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of a creature which had once so loved me. But this feeling soon gave place to irritation, and then came, as if to my final and irrevocable overthrow, the spirit of perverseness. Of this spirit, philosophy takes no account. Yet I'm not more sure that my soul lives that I am that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart, one of the indivisible primary faculties or sentiments which gives direction to the character of man. Who has not a hundred times found himself committing a vile or a silly action for no other reason than because he knows he should not? Have we not a perpetual inclination in the teeth of our best judgment to violate that which is law merely because we understand it to be such? This spirit of perverseness, I say, came to my final overthrow. It was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself, to offer violence to its own nature, to do wrong for the wrong's sake only, 
that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury I had inflicted upon the unoffending brute. One morning, in cool blood, I slipped a noose about its neck and hung it to the limb of a tree, hung it with the tears streaming from my eyes and with the bitterest remorse at my heart, hung it because I knew that it had loved me and because I felt it had given me no reason of offense, hung it because I knew that in so doing I was committing a sin, a deadly sin that would so jeopardize my immortal soul as to place it, if such a thing were possible, even beyond the reach of the infinite mercy of the most merciful and most terrible God. On the night of the day on which this cruel deed was done, I was aroused from sleep by the cry of fire. The curtains of my bed were in flames. The whole house was blazing. It was with great difficulty that my wife, a servant, and myself made our escape from the conflagration. The destruction was complete. My entire worldly wealth was swallowed up, and I resigned myself thenceforward to despair. I am above the weakness of seeking to establish a sequence of cause and effect between the disaster and the atrocity. But I am detailing a chain of facts and wish not to leave even a possible link imperfect. On the day succeeding the fire, I visited the ruins. The walls, with one exception, had fallen in. This exception was found in a compartment wall, not very thick, which stood about the middle of the house and against which I had rested the head of my bed. The plastering had here in great measure resisted the action of the fire, a fact which I attributed to its having been recently spread. About this wall a dense crowd were collected, and many persons seemed to be examining a particular portion of it with very minute and eager attention. The words, strange, singular, and other similar expressions excited my curiosity. I approached and saw as if graven in bas relief upon the white surface the figure of a gigantic cat. The impression was given with an accuracy truly marvelous. There was a rope about the animal's neck. When I first beheld this apparition, for I could scarcely regard it as less, my wonder and my terror were extreme but at length reflection came to my aid. The cat, I remembered, had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house. Upon the alarm of fire, this garden had been immediately filled by the crowd, by some one of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown through an open window into my chamber. This had probably been done with the view of arousing me from sleep. The falling of other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of the freshly spread plaster, the lime of which, with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass, had been accomplished the portrait as I saw it. Although I thus readily accounted to my reason, yet not altogether to my conscience for the startling fact just detailed, it did not the less fail to make a deep impression upon my fancy. For months, I could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat, and during this period there came back into my spirit a half-sentiment that seemed but was not remorse. I went so far as to regret the loss of the animal and to look about me among the vile haunts which I now habitually frequented for another pet of the same species and of somewhat similar appearance with which to supply its place. One night, as I sat half stupefied in a den of more than infamy, my attention was suddenly drawn to some black object reposing upon the head of one of the immense hogsheads of gin or of rum which constituted the chief furniture of the apartment. I had been looking steadily at the top of this hogshead for some minutes, and what now caused me surprise was the fact that I had not sooner perceived the object thereupon. I approached it, and touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, a very large one, fully as large as Pluto and closely resembling him in every respect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite splotch of white covering nearly the whole region of the breast. 
Upon my touching him, he immediately arose, purred loudly, rubbed against my hand, and appeared delighted with my notice. This then was the very creature of which I was in search. I at once offered to purchase it off the landlord, but this person made no claim to it, knew nothing of it, had never seen it before. I continued my caresses, and when I prepared to go home, the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me. I permitted it to do so, occasionally stooping and patting it as I proceeded. When it reached the house, it domesticated itself at once and became immediately a great favorite with my wife. For my own part, I soon found a dislike to it arising within me. This was just the reverse of what I had anticipated, but I know not how or why it was, its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed. By slow degrees, these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into the bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature. A certain sense of shame and the remembrance of my former deed of cruelty preventing me from physically abusing it. I did not for some weeks strike or otherwise violently ill use it, but gradually, very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing and to flee silently from its odious presence as from the breath of a pestilence. What added no doubt to my hatred of the beast was the discovery on the morning after I brought it home that like Pluto, it also had been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance, however, only endeared it to my wife, who, as I have already said, possessed in a high degree that humanity of feeling which had once been my distinguishing trait and the source of many of my simplest and purest pleasures. With my aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for myself seemed to increase it followed my footsteps with a pertinacity which it would be difficult to make the reader comprehend. Whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees, covering me with its loathsome caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get between my feet and thus nearly throw me down, or fastening its long and sharp claws in my dress, clamor in this manner to my breast. At such times, although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from doing so, partly by a memory of my former crime, but chiefly, let me confess it at once, my absolute dread of the beast. This dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil, and yet I should be at a loss how otherwise to define it. I'm almost ashamed to own yes, even in this felon's cell I am almost ashamed to own, that the terror and horror with which the animal inspired me had been heightened by one of the merest chimeras it would be possible to conceive. My wife had called my attention more than once to the character of the mark of white hair of which I have spoken, and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one I had destroyed. The reader will remember that this mark, although large, had been originally very indefinite, but by slow degrees, degrees nearly imperceptible and which for a long time my reason struggled to reject as fanciful, it had at length assumed a rigorous distinctness of outline. It was now the representation of an object that I shudder to name. And for this, above all, I loathed and dreaded and would have rid myself of the monster had I dared. It was now, I say, the image of a hideous, of a ghastly thing, of the gallows, oh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and of crime, of agony and of death. And now I was indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity, and a brute beast whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed, a brute beast to work out for me, for me a man fashioned in the image of the high god so much of insufferable woe. Alas, neither by day nor by night I knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the former, the creature left me no moment alone, and in the latter I started hourly from dreams of unutterable fear to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face and its vast weight an incarnate nightmare that I had no power to shake off, incumbent eternally upon my heart. Beneath the pressure of torments such as these, 
the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbed. Evil thoughts became my sole intimates, the darkest and most evil of thoughts. The moodiness of my usual temper increased to hatred of all things and of all mankind, while from the sudden, frequent, and ungovernable outbursts of a fury to which I now blindly abandoned myself, my uncomplaining wife, alas, was the most usual and the most patient of sufferers. One day she accompanied me upon some household errand into the cellar of the old building which our poverty compelled us to inhabit. The cat followed me down the steep stairs and, nearly throwing me headlong, exasperated me to madness. Uplifting an axe and forgetting in my wrath the childish dread which had hitherto stayed my hand, I aimed a blow at the animal which, of course, would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as I wished. But this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife. Goaded by the interference into a rage more than demoniacal, I withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain. She fell dead upon the spot without a groan. This hideous murder accomplished, I set myself forthwith and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body. I knew that I could not remove it from the house either by day or by night without the risk of being observed by the neighbors. Many projects entered my mind. At one period, I thought of cutting the corpse into minute fragments and destroying them by fire. At another, I resolved to dig a grave for it in the floor of the cellar. Again, I deliberated about casting it in the well in the yard, about packing it in a box as if merchandise with the usual arrangements, and so getting a porter to take it from the house. Finally, I hit upon what I considered a far better expedient than either of these. I determined to wall it up in the cellar, as the monks of the Middle Ages are recorded to have walled up their victims. For a purpose such as this, the cellar was well adapted. Its walls were loosely constructed and had lately been plastered throughout with a rough plaster which the dampness of the atmosphere had prevented from hardening. Moreover, in one of the walls was a projection caused by a false chimney or fireplace that had been filled up and made to resemble the rest of the cellar. I made no doubt that I could readily displace the bricks at this point, insert the corpse, and wall the hole up as before so that no eye could detect anything suspicious. And in this calculation, I was not deceived. By means of a crowbar, I easily dislodged the bricks, and having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall, I propped it in that position, while with little trouble, I relayed the whole structure as it originally stood. Having procured mortar, sand, and hair with every possible precaution, I prepared a plaster which could not be distinguished from the old, and with this I very carefully went over the new brickwork. When I had finished, I felt satisfied that all was right. The wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. The rubbish on the floor was picked up with the minutest care. I looked around triumphantly and said to myself, here at least then my labor has not been in vain. My next step was to look for the beast, which had been the cause of so much wretchedness, for I had at length firmly resolved to put it to death. Had I been able to meet with it at the moment, there could have been no doubt of its fate, but it appeared that the crafty animal had been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger and forbore to present itself in my present mood. It's impossible to describe or to imagine the deep, the blissful sense of relief which the absence of the detested creature occasioned in my bosom. It did not make its appearance during the night, and thus, for one night at least, since its introduction into the house, I soundly and tranquilly slept. I slept even with the burden of murder upon my soul. The second and third day passed and still my tormentor came not. Once again, I breathed as a free man. The monster in terror had fled the premises forever. I should behold it no more. My happiness was supreme. The guilt of my dark deed disturbed me but little. Some few inquiries had been made, but these had been readily answered. Even a search had been instituted, but of course nothing was to be discovered. I looked upon my future felicity as secured. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, 
A party of the police came, very unexpectedly, into the house and proceeded again to make a rigorous investigation of the premises. Secure, however, in the inscrutability of the place of concealment, I felt no embarrassment whatsoever. The officers bade me accompany them in their search. They left no nook or corner unexplored. At length, for the third or fourth time, they descended into the cellar. I quivered not in a muscle. My heart beat calmly as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end. I folded my arms upon my bosom and roamed easily to and fro. The police were thoroughly satisfied and prepared to depart. The glee at my heart was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say if but one word, by way of triumph and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. Gentlemen, I said at last as the party ascended the steps, I delight to have allayed your suspicions. I wish you all health and a little more courtesy. By the by, gentlemen, this, this is a very well-constructed house. The rabid desire to say something easily, I scarcely knew what I uttered at all. I may say an excellently well-constructed house. These walls, are you going, gentlemen? These walls are solidly put together, and here, through the mere frenzy of bravado, I rapped heavily with a cane which I held in my hand upon that very portion of the brickwork behind which stood the corpse of the wife of my bosom. But may God shield and deliver me from the fangs of the arch-fiend. No sooner had the reverberation of my blows sunk into silence than I was answered by a voice from within the tomb, by a cry, at first muffled and broken, like the sobbing of a child, and then quickly swelling into one long, loud and continuous scream, utterly anomalous and inhuman, a howl, a wailing shriek, half of horror and half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell, conjointly from the throats of the damned in their agony and of the demons that exult in the damnation. Of my thoughts, it is folly to speak. Swooning, I staggered to the opposite wall. For one instant, the party upon the stairs remained motionless, through extremity of terror and of awe. In the next, a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall. It fell bodily. The corpse, already greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood erect before the eyes of the spectators. Upon its head, with red extended mouth and solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced me into murder and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman. I had walled the monster up within the tomb. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production of Barler House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. And a final thought. You can't force someone to respect you, but you can refuse to be disrespected. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Imagine waking up one morning and when you look at your friends or loved ones, you see their ears, noses, and mouths stretched back with deep grooves on their foreheads, cheeks, and chins. All the people you know have suddenly turned into hideous, demonic creatures, and it's not even remotely close to Halloween. That's what one Tennessee man is experiencing right now. I talk about him in this week's Mind of Marler, which you can find at mindofmarler.com.